there are chemicals that we can add to enzymes that will affect enzymes and affect their activity. All right? That's not surprising. Enzymes are chemicals themselves. So we can imagine chemicals reacting with chemicals doing things. There's a chemical called diisopyrophosphofluoridate, which I'm not going to ask you to remember. You can call it DIPF. 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 DIPF will chemically react with serine side chains in a protein. DIPF will chemically react with serine side chains in a protein. Why do I tell you this? Well, when it reacts, it's making a chemical bond and it doesn't go away. It stays there. It's a covalent bond. It remains attached to the enzyme. I might want to ask the question, is an enzyme that I am studying, is it using a serine side chain, which is a hydroxyl group, is it using a serine side chain as a part of the reaction that it catalyzes? I would like to know the answer to that question. How would I determine it? Well, one of the ways I would determine it is I would take my enzyme, <coughs> I would treat it with DIPF, and then I would ask the question, does the enzyme still catalyze the reaction or not? Because if DIPF is on the serine and the serine is necessary, it's going to cover up the serine and the enzyme is not going to be able to function. Okay, So DIPF is going to tell me if a serine plays a role in the catalysis of the enzyme. Does that make sense? So I treat my, my enzyme with DIPF. The enzyme binds to it covalently. And as a consequence of that, if serine is, is it necessary for the enzyme, the enzyme will no longer function if that's the case. If I treat my enzyme with DIPF and it still continues to work, then I can say that serine is not involved. Okay? Well, I tell you this because in the case of chymotrypsin, of course, serine is involved. In the active site of serine, uh, active site of serine in the active site of chymotrypsin, there's a serine residue. And that serine residue plays a very important role. It becomes attached to that acetate group that we saw in the reaction. That means if I take chymotrypsin and I treat it with DIPF, what's going to happen? Chymotrypsin is going to be dead in the water. It's not going to be able to catalyze the reaction because its serine residue is covered up, and that serine residue is necessary for chymotrypsin's action. There are other enzymes that use serines, and you can do experiments with them in exactly the same way and see if that is the case. Okay? Here is the tertiary structure of chymotrypsin, and here's the active site. The active site is, of course, the place where the reaction is catalyzed, and that's where that serine residue is. In the active site, we discover three enzymes that are in very close proximity to each other. Serine is one of them. Histidine is another one of them, and aspartic acid is the third. Serine, histidine, and aspartic acid. They're in close proximity, and they help to catalyze the reaction. If you change any of those amino acids to any other amino acids, the enzyme doesn't work nearly as well. These three enzymes are called the catalytic triad. Well, I'll show you how they work in a minute, but they're called the catalytic triad because they work together to help the reaction to be catalyzed. That's the name of the three amino acids that work together, the catalytic triad. Okay. Now this catalytic triad for chymotrypsin also is, is present for other similar enzymes. Trypsin, for example, has a catalytic triad exactly the same. So it's used a very, very similar mechanism to what I'm talking about here. Okay. Now, here's the one place we're going to talk about mechanism, and I'm going to try to be careful. I'm going to try to make it as, as, as basic as I can. Okay. We are looking in the active site of chymotrypsin. Here are those three amino acids. Well, actually, you don't even see aspartic acid. It's over here somewhere. Okay, 
But there are three amino acids, serine, histidine, and you can imagine aspartic acid over here. What happens during the catalysis uh, in chymotrypsin? Well, let's think about this. What did the induced fit model tell us about how an enzyme worked? What happened to the enzyme with the sub when the substrate came to it? Anybody remember? It slightly changed shape, right? So we can imagine that when we slightly change the shape of that enzyme, that we might slightly change the distances between the serine, the histidine, and the aspartic acid. So the binding of the substrate causes the enzyme to change shape slightly. Okay, The substrate is another protein, and it's sitting out here waiting for its bond to be cleaved. So the other protein that's going to have its bond cleaved has been bound. The chymotrypsin has changed its shape, and now the histidine is getting very close over here to the serine. It gets so close that the histidine pulls a proton off of serine and leaves behind something called an alkoxide ion. All it is is a negatively charged oxygen. But that alkoxide ion is very, very reactive. I'll repeat. So repeating, the protein bound to the active site, the protein that's going to get cut bound to the active site, Okay, it caused the chymotrypsin enzyme to change shape slightly. The histidine got close to the serine and it pulled a proton off of it. Now, I'm not talking about aspartic acid here because, because it, it facilitates this process, but it's not essential for us to understand at this point. Okay? At that point, we have an oxygen that has a negative charge that is very reactive called the alkoxide ion. That alkox... I'm sorry? Yeah, A-L-K-O-X-I-D-E. The alkoxide ion now attacks the peptide bond in the protein that's been bound. The alkoxide ion is binding, is, is attacking the peptide bond in the protein that's been bound. When it attacks the peptide bond, two things happen. One, one piece of the protein is released, just like we saw with the yellow color. One piece of the protein is released. The other piece of the protein is left behind, and it's attached to the serine. So we see the fast step has just happened. The fast step is that we've had the release of one piece of the, of the protein that was bound. And now we've got the other piece of the protein that's attached to the serine. The slow step is going to be involved now in releasing that other piece. Now, I think that's enough mechanism for us to understand at this point. I'll stop and take questions here. You guys could explain that mechanism to me? Back question back there, yeah. Generally, uh, her question is, would you need to, on an exam, to draw it or verbally do it. In general, I think verbal I kind of prefer because I'm a terrible artist and I would hate to think that I was grading you on your artistry in doing that. Uh, if you want to draw it and we can understand what you're drawing, usually words help uh, with that, but uh, I'm open to, to whatever uh, that you have there. Okay. Yes? Okay. It's a negatively charged oxygen that's attached to something else. So an alkoxide is just that, a negatively charged oxygen that's attached to something else. So in this case, it's attached to the rest of the serine amino acid. Okay? Alkoxide ions are extraordinarily reactive. You find that negatively charged oxygens, there are things called superoxides, for example, are very, very reactive. They will react with the first thing they run into. In this case, in the alkoxide ion, the first thing it runs into is the peptide bond. Bang. Peptide bond, gone. Yes, and Lynette. Um, so when you say binding of the substrate, that's a protein just in general? The substrate, in this case, is a protein that's being cut by the chymotrypsin. That's so correct. The enzyme we're talking about is chymotrypsin. The enzyme we're talking about is chymotrypsin. And so the histidine gets close to serine, and the histidine pulls the proton off? That's correct. So histidine pulls the proton off of the 
hydroxyl group on the serine, and that's what creates the alkoxide ion. If we don't bind, I'm sorry, just one, one more thing. If, if we don't bind the substrate, then histidine isn't close enough to do that. Only when, when, the, when the protein binds the active site does the enzyme change shape properly for that to happen. Uh, question over here. Then is this a specific protein that binds to that active good, site? Good question. It's not a specific protein, but it's a specific sequence. So it recognizes, remember how, we talk, how I talked about when we, when we cut with trypsin, it cut next to lysines and arginines? Only if we have a lysine or arginine in the case of trypsin would it make that cut. If it were something else, it wouldn't. It wouldn't fit in the active site, and it wouldn't, then nothing would happen. Chymotrypsin, as I say, is a little bit more complicated because it binds a bunch of things, but still, it requires a certain thing in that active site. Okay? Yes, sir? Can I go back to I'm sorry, say again? Repeat what it is? Is that what you said? Yeah. So the catalytic triad is three amino acids. Aspartic acid, histidine, and serine. Now, I haven't talked about aspartic acid here, but I'll just briefly tell you. Aspartic acid is, is sitting over here. And what it does is when that enzyme changes shape, it's actually pushing the, the histidine closer. So it's not shown in this figure, but the aspartic acid does play a role in this process. The three work in concert. That's correct. Yeah. And the catalytic triad, as I said, we see in many different proteases. Proteases that work by this mechanism have a name. They're called serine proteases. Serine proteases. Because they all have a catalytic triad, and they all use serine to attack the peptide bond through an alkoxide ion. So if I compared the mechanism of trypsin to the mechanism of chymotrypsin, I would see they're essentially identical. Different enzymes. They even have different amino acid sequences, but they have the same catalytic triad positioned in space in the same way. Pretty cool. Yes, sir? Yeah, aspartic acid, as I said, is up over here. And what it does is it helps to push the histidine over so that when the, it's just not shown in this figure, but it helps to push the histidine over so the histidine can take that proton away. Yes? Say it again. Does the substrate change shape too? The answer is probably it does, yes. Um, and one of the things that you see happens with um, catalytic action is there's usually some sort of strain that's happened. And that strain can happen as a result of the enzyme flexing with the changes that are going on. So they, in, in concert, are both undergoing changes. Yeah. Did I see a question? Hand? Yeah. OK. So there's two steps. So the first step involves breakage of the peptide bond. That releases one piece immediately. All right. The other piece is stuck to the serine. You see it's stuck right there. When this piece gets released, that's the slow step. And that uh, has to happen before the enzyme's back where it starts. So the first part, you see, you see here's, the, here's the protein. We see R2. You see that? The R2 is released first. It just goes bang. It's out of there. Okay. R2 has been released. There's nothing to hold it in place. That's quick. The release of the R1, which is the other half of the protein, is released more slowly. Okay. Everybody got that? It's nice outside. Why don't we call it a day? Serine proteases. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Hi, how are you doing? I just had a quick question. Okay. Um, so when you're talking about the reaction, yeah. So when it releases the enzyme, then does it go back and do this again? But it does. does it, it does. So it goes back and does this real quick, and then it slows back. You know, so it's, it's a